Hope you're having a great day today. It's good to be with you again. My name is Jason Dexter, and today we are continuing our Bible study series on the book of Revelation, and within that, our series on the seven letters to the seven churches. So today we come to the church of Sardis, which is known as the dead or the dying church. It's not a very good label which Jesus gives this church. Now, we ourselves, of course, don't want to be dead or dying. So in today's passage, we'll see how we can be alive in Christ. Let's go ahead and read Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and see what Jesus says to the church of Sardis and also to us. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent, for you will not wake up. Sorry, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this letter follows a very similar pattern to the others we've seen so far. Uh, We will see in verse 1 that we have the greeting from Jesus and then also the criticism. Then in verses 2 to 3 is Jesus' counsel for this church. Verse 4 is some commendation for a few select saints within the church. Verse 5 is promise and reward. And then verse 6 is a reminder to hear and listen what the Spirit says to the churches. So we're going to start from the beginning first with the greeting. And it's written to the angel of the church in Sardis. As we've seen in our study, that word angel is a word for messenger, which means the messenger of the church or the leader of the church who would then pass on the message to his church. Now, Jesus, for all of these letters, gives a specific description of himself, which is related to the specific need in that church. So here Jesus says the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. This description comes from chapter 1 in a couple of places there, uh, the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So if you want to know more about that, you can catch our study of Revelation 1 to know more about the seven spirits of God. There are several possible interpretations for this, but the most likely interpretation is that this itself is a reference to the Holy Spirit. That also seems to make sense within this context here in this passage. Uh, It's especially important that this church receives the Holy Spirit because the problem with this church is that it is largely dead. So it's important for them to know that Jesus would send the Holy Spirit to revive and regenerate them, which is what the Holy Spirit does. Titus 3, 5, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit regenerates and renews. And that is what this dead church needed. So Jesus is saying, I am working with the Holy Spirit. I can bring the Holy Spirit to you. I can send the Holy Spirit which this is the same thing that Jesus promised before uh, to, to his disciples. He said, it's good for me to go because then I will send a helper to you. That's the Holy Spirit. So these people needed the Holy Spirit. They needed revival. And if they would rely on Jesus, then he would help and he would strengthen them. Now, many churches are dead because blind tradition or rules are followed instead of a dependence on Jesus. What is a church without the Holy Spirit? Well, it's not really a church at all. 
this church needed a spiritual revival. So besides saying the seven spirits of God, probably a reference to the Holy Spirit, he says that he has the seven stars. In uh, Revelation 1.20, these stars are described as being the leaders of the churches. He says the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels, the leaders are the messengers of the seven churches. Okay, so basically Jesus is saying, I come to you with the Holy Spirit and I'm holding you, the leader of the church, in my hand. I can support you. I can strengthen you. I can sustain you. I can give you what you need to then pass on to the church to wake them up so they can receive spiritual life. So we see a very important application already here in verse 1. What is the solution to a dead, robotic Christianity? What is the solution to a church where people go, but there's no real spiritual life? Is the solution more programs, more or better music? The solution is Jesus. Jesus is the one who brings spiritual life. Jesus is the one who sends the Holy Spirit. If there is a church that is in need of revival, the only solution for that church is coming to Jesus. Apart from him, we can do nothing. So Jesus says at the very beginning, what you need, I have it. And that is true for all the churches. Whatever you as an individual or your church needs, Jesus has it. He is always the solution for the problem of the churches. Now Jesus says here in the second half of verse 1, he says, I know your works. Once again, we see this phrase repeated. Jesus says the same phrase to every church, and it's a double-edged sword. It means he's well aware of and appreciates the good, but he also knows the bad. We can keep no secrets from him. So remind yourself that whatever you're doing, Jesus is watching. He knows. That awareness in itself will help keep you on the right track. Now, Jesus here gives his criticism to the church. He says, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Now, for most churches, Jesus started off with a commendation and then moved to criticism. But here, Jesus starts off with the problem of the church, and it's a big one. You're dead. Right now, imagine if there's a person in front of you and maybe the person has some problems. Let's say they're not a, a guy, not particularly handsome or not particularly intelligent or not particularly kind. But the person is actually dead. So what are you going to say? Well, you're not kind. Well, he's dead, right? The deadness, that's the problem here. And that's the problem with this church. This church is dead. Okay, this is a big problem problem. Now, what does it mean to be dead? The Bible is very clear. Death, spiritual death, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's from Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Spiritual death. Now there's different kinds of death. Physical death is separation of your soul from your body. Spiritual death is separation of our spirit, our soul from God. And so the problem with this church is that there were many, many, many unbelievers in the church people who had the reputation of being alive, but in fact, they were dead. So there were, yeah, a lot of people who were not real believers in this church. Uh, now, we should point out that not everyone in this church falls into this category. Down in verse 4, we will see, he says, Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Okay, so there are some believers there. But that's just a few. The majority are not. And that's a serious problem. Now we see they had a reputation for being alive. 
In other words, they thought they were saved, and others looked at them and thought they were saved. On the outside, they looked good. They did the things that Christians do. They said the things that Christians say. But Jesus knew the truth. And the truth is, they were spiritually dead. All, they were active in church. They were probably regular members, but they were on their way to hell. Now, that is a very frightening thing to know that there are many people in church who go even every Sunday, maybe every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, they're there, and yet they're dead and on their way to hell. This is a wake-up call to the church and to us. We don't want to be in that category. There is nothing worse in life than facing Jesus one day and hearing him say, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, I don't want to be in that category, and I'm sure you don't as well. But Jesus said there will be many in that category. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone in Sardis who goes to church, not everyone who goes to your church will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. The worst words a person can ever hear. So why do many people think that they are saved but aren't? And how can we make sure that we don't fall into that category? Well, there are things that people do which they rely on for salvation. And there's a lot of things which a Christian may do, non-Christian may also do, things which don't prove or disprove salvation. So here are some things that do not show a person is saved and alive in Christ. Attending church. These people in Sardis were attending church. Taking communion. You can take communion every week for 50 years and not be saved. Baptism. There are many people who are baptized who are not saved. Just because you are baptized doesn't mean you are saved. Tithing. Giving money. Doesn't guarantee salvation. The Pharisees gave money as well. Singing worship songs. Prayer. Calling oneself a Christian. Saying, I'm a Christian. Or reading the Bible. These are things which don't prove salvation. Now, we don't have time to do a whole study on this today. If you want to know more about how to know if you're really a believer, then study the book of 1 John. And on our website, Study and Obey, you can find a study on 1 John. And in the book of 1 John, there are many, many tests about what is a real believer. Uh, here are some of them. Many of these are from 1 John, not all. So things that do evidence a genuine belief. Walking in the light. This is from 1 John 1, 6 and 7. We walk in the light. Confessing sin. Real believers will recognize their sin and acknowledge it and repent of it. Keeping his commands. Real believers love him and obey him. Loving the brethren. Jesus said, uh, God said in uh, 1 John, how can you love God? whom you don't see if you don't love your brother whom you see. Believers pursue holiness. Okay, They're being sanctified. We're not perfect, but we are growing. We are seeking that. We are working towards holiness. True believers have the Holy Spirit and are sealed by the Holy Spirit. True believers have good fruit. Jesus said a bad tree bears bad fruit and a good tree bears good fruit. And true believers love God. So these are a few things that real believers do. Now John 5 24 says if you hear his words and believe then you have eternal life. So objectively speaking we must have real faith and if we have real faith then it will be followed with action. You can see that in James 2 where he says faith without works is dead but a real faith that is alive comes with works. Now, what we see here in this church in Sardis is that their works were not found complete in the sight of God. Verse 2, he says, I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. So because they were dead spiritually, none of the works which they did pleased God. 
a spiritually dead person cannot please God. But on the other hand, if you have a real faith, a living faith, then it will lead to actions that please God. I heard someone say this week a phrase and I really liked it. They said, we are human beings, not human doers. And that means we be first. First is we are transformed. We are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. That makes us into a child of God. And after you are, then there are certain actions that will follow as you do. Now, there are some churches which are composed of primarily spiritually dead people. I visited a family member in Europe a few years ago, and I saw so many huge buildings, and some have church services. Now, some of these buildings, I actually saw advertisements pasted on the side of them. Uh, these were, and then you also had to buy a ticket to go in, and people show up for Christmas and Easter. And in the, some of these countries, a lot of people might call themselves Christians. Now, many believe that in Western countries, the culture or the people are primarily Christian, and they may have this reputation, like the church in Sardis, they had a reputation of being alive. But in many of these churches, there's very little spiritual life. There's a sad, lifeless, dead Christianity. And there are many congregations in the world that are like this. Why are they like this? A lot of times is because the gospel is absent. My father said he went to a church for all of his life and he never heard the gospel until he was in university outside of that church. That is a very sad thing that you can go to church for years, for decades, and not hear the true gospel and not hear about Jesus being the solution to sins and repentance and all of these things that are part of the gospel. So there is a certain that the truth is absent and the Bible is not taught in a powerful, clear, bold way. Sometimes seminaries are the culprit where people go to these seminaries and these seminaries are quickly abandoning the truth and compromising with the world. In the desire to stay relevant or to be relevant, they compromise and then lose the very power which draws people to God. So we need to evaluate our own lives in our own church. Now, if you're attending a church that is mostly dead, maybe you need to find one that's alive or maybe you need to be the instrument of God bringing revival to your church. But we need to make sure that we are not just going through the motions. It's especially important for people like me who my parents were believers and I grew up having family devotions and going to church and Sunday school and Awana club and reading the Bible and all of these things. But I had to ask myself many times as a teenager and as I was growing up, do I really believe this or is it just my parents' faith? God has no grandchildren. Every person must come to their own personal belief in the Lord. We must have our own personal relationship with him. So don't trust in your parents or your relatives or family's faith. You need to have your own. So Jesus gives counsel to this dead or dying church. In verse 2, he says, Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your faith, your works complete in the sight of my God. Who is he directing this to? Wake up and strengthen what remains. Probably this is directed to, well, we know in verse 1, the leader of the church. Okay, so the leader of the church was likely a believer. But the church at, at large had little spiritual life. There were few believers. And the number of believers seemed to be decreasing. And perhaps also those believers whom, who there were, were also decreasing likely in spiritual zeal. So before long, the church would die out unless there was revival. Now, many congregations and some entire denominations are like this. Death of a church or denomination is often slow. It often starts with compromise, poor teaching, and a lack of hunger for the word are major factors. Leaders start going through the motions and the congregation follows. And what you will see is that the congregation demographics age. People get older and older and few new people join. 
because there's no power in the preaching or the life of the church, people drift away from the Lord. The gospel isn't preached and then transformation doesn't happen. So what's left is there will be a few people who are Christians in name trying to sustain something of the past. Now sometimes, of course, there are very real Christians mixed in. But if revival doesn't happen, they will die off and the church will not be saved. And then what is left is a bunch of empty facilities. And finally, these are sold off. Unfortunately, this is something that's happening even now all over the West, especially in Europe. Hundreds of church buildings are being sold and converted into inns, clubs, bars, and even mosques because the congregation has died and there are no more believers remaining. What is Jesus' counsel? Wake up! Strengthen what remains and is about to die. The real believers who are in those churches need to wake up. Stop being silent. They need to do something. They need to preach the true gospel. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Through the true believers, revival can still happen. But if the believers do not wake up and zealously seek in, to proclaim the truth, the entire thing will die with them. And they will leave nothing behind for future generations. How sad is that? Some of these churches, they've had congregations continuously for hundreds of years, and now they're gone and the church building is sold off and becomes a bar. The movement has completely died out and there's no lasting impact on the world for Christ. This is actually what's happened to this church in Sardis. I checked and there is no church. In fact, there's no really city there in Sardis at all. The Christian movement here in this place died out. So for application, how can you strengthen what remains. Does your church need revival? Can you be an instrument of revival? Preach the gospel. Preach the truth of God's word. That is the solution. That's what Jesus said in verse 1. He has the Holy Spirit. He will send the Holy Spirit to help if the people are willing and repentant. So you should be thinking about what can you do to make an impact for Christ that will last into the next generation. Hebrews 9.27 says, Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Unless the rapture comes first, we are going to die. And what are we going to leave behind? I want to leave behind something that will continue to work for God even after I'm gone. Now part of that is my children who I hope will become believers and then carry on this movement. But not only physical children, there can also be spiritual children and disciples whom we train up to pass on the good news to others. So Jesus is the solution. The only way to get strength is from Jesus. John 15, 5, he says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So we must come to him for spiritual nourishment. That's the root problem of many churches and individual believers. No amount of programs can replace our need for Christ. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the living water. He is the resurrection and the life. He has everything that we need. Are you close to him? Jesus says, I have not found your works complete. In other words, they did something, maybe something that even looks good. A lot of these kinds of churches do a lot of charity work, but they're not complete. They're missing the true gospel, which changes lives. Then Jesus gives the counsel, remember then what you've received and heard. Keep it and repent. Now the people of the church of Sardis had heard the gospel. They knew the truth. But somewhere along the way, they'd forgotten it and become distracted. Image had become more important than substance. The counsel was simple. Remember and repent. Remember the gospel. Salvation from sin is in Christ alone. We are saved by grace through faith and that not of works. So in remembering that, they needed to repent. In Galatians 
3.3. Paul says, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? The only way to begin the Christian life is in the Spirit, and the only way to continue is by the Spirit. So the counsel for them is remember and repent. Now then there's a warning here in the latter part of verse 3. He says, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. You will not know at what hour I will come against you. This seems to be a reference to judgment. The church of Sardis would be judged. And that judgment was going to come without warning. God is gracious. God is patient. And God gives many, many opportunities to repent. Even here, he doesn't judge them immediately. He says, you can still repent. However, at some future point in time that's unknown to us but known to God, there will be no more chances. His patience will run out. That line will be crossed. This is true for every person. Right now, you have an opportunity to come back to God. We don't know about later, tonight, tomorrow. We don't know when the last opportunity will be, but he knows. So for the church in Sardis, he gave them more time, which demonstrates his mercy toward them. But that time is limited. So they would be wise to repent while they still could. Now we don't know how much time we have, and we don't know how many opportunities to repent God will give us. If we are prudent, what should we do? That demands we come to him in repentance as soon as possible. Don't put God to the test. Now is the day of salvation. We don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Moving forward, Jesus does give some commendation. In verse 4, he says, Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Not everyone in the church was dead. Some were living holy lives, and Jesus was pleased with them and promises that they would walk with him in white. He commends them as being worthy. Now from this, we see God's character. He is fair. He doesn't judge the righteous along with the wicked. He doesn't condemn an entire group if the entire group is not guilty. He judges each one individually. We see that with Abraham, and Abraham is pleading with God, don't judge the righteous along with the wicked. And God answers that prayer, and God saves Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah and the judgment that is coming upon them. And in the same way, uh, there's a command in the Old Testament law that a child would not be judged for his parents' sins. And so those believers in Sardis would not face that same judgment that the group was going to face. And that's an encouraging thing. You might be the only member of your family who follows God. Don't worry about the others as far as worrying about the maybe the pressure that they put on you or that somehow you would be judged for their sins or their decisions. No. God looks at each one individually and holds them responsible for their own decisions and actions. We should also remember too that even if someone does something against us, we think, okay, now I'm justified in doing something in return. You aren't. Okay, God you cannot control what that person does, but you can control your own actions. And that's what God is going to hold you accountable for. So even in the midst of perhaps an entire group, an entire culture or country, or even a church that's dead, know that if you are faithful, God will see, God will be pleased, and he will reward. And so we see the promise of reward in verse 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. To the one who conquers. This phrase appears in each letter. And for each group of people in the church, there's something specific they need to conquer. So for the believers in the church of Sardis, they need to conquer this dead or lifeless Christian culture. They need to conquer the temptation of falling into apathy, losing their spiritual zeal, and just following tradition rather than Christ. 
They needed to conquer those challenges even from within the church. And if they overcame, then there's a promise. They're going to be clothed in white garments. Now, God is the one who provides the garments. If you remember the parable of the wedding feast, there was one guest there who came dressed in his own clothes. Perhaps he thought his clothes were nice enough and he can make it on his own. And the master casts him out of this feast. And Jesus says that those who are not wearing the proper clothes will also be cast out and judged. Now, the interesting thing is God provides the clothes, okay? So the master of this banquet gives a free, beautiful set of clothing to every single person. Great deal. All you have to do is be willing to put it on. But if you say, I don't need the clothes from God, I don't need his righteousness, I have my own, that's the problem. That pride and self-righteousness is what will doom us. So we cannot clothe ourselves in white. But he clothes us in white if we will come to him. We cannot make ourselves acceptable through any amount of self-effort. All of the works which this dead church was doing was not enough to please God. Because even our good deeds is as filthy rags in God's sight. Unless we do it through Christ. So this was part of the problem of the church of Sardis. They looked good. They had some works, they followed some traditions, but they didn't come to the source to get their white robes. And in the end, they tried to clothe themselves. God would not accept that. So there's an application for us. Again, come to Jesus. He's the source. He's the only one who can offer spiritual life. He's the only one who can offer righteousness. So besides the promise to clothe us in white, he also says, I will never blot his name out of the book of life. The book of life is the book that every believer's name is written in. This is the record of who has eternal life. Now, if we look at Revelation 13, 8, we will see that, that the names are written there before the foundation of the world. It says, and all who dwell on earth will worship it, and everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Okay, so the names of believers are written there before the foundation of the world. There is no more important record than this. If your name is written there, you'll go to heaven. If your name is not written there, you won't. So the question arises from this verse, can a person's name be removed? In other words, can you lose your salvation? Okay, he says here, I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. Now the verse means that if you conquer, God will not erase your name from the book. You will be safe. You are protected. You are secure. So here, it's not a threat, okay? He's not threatening and saying, you'd better be careful. I might erase your name. Or, yeah, you know, sometimes I just decide to erase someone's name you know, just, just because he's not arbitrary, he's not capricious, okay? This is a promise, not a threat. And his promise is that if you conquer, your name will never be removed. What does that mean? Well, real believers will conquer, okay? If you are called, if you are chosen by him, he writes your name there before the beginning of the world, he will then give you the strength to conquer, Okay, if, you, if your faith is real to believe in him, then it will have action. Okay, he will be with you and he will help you to conquer in those difficult times. Those who persevere will remain in the book. And real believers will persevere, not because of their strength, but because of his. In the book of John, it says that Jesus is holding us in his hand. And no one can remove us from his hand. Okay. So if we go back, and I want to go back again to Revelation 13 8, and we can see that here. It says, all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Everyone whose name is not in the book of life will worship this Antichrist. But what about those whose name are? They won't, okay? So... Those whose name is in the book of life will not 
worship it. Why? Because their names are in the book of life. God will not allow them to commit this folly to worship this image. God will give them the strength to resist. They will not worship this image or this beast. God will keep them from folly. He will cause them to persevere. So being in the book means you will not deny the faith finally. God will protect you from apostasy. If your name is in the book, you will conquer. And if you conquer, your name will stay in the book. God is the one who puts your name there before the world begins. And he is the one who gives strength to stay the course. So rather than looking at this verse and being afraid, thinking my name's going to be removed, we should look at this verse and be encouraged. Your name will stay there. God will give you the strength to conquer and stay the course and press on, and he will never remove your name from that book. And yet in God's word, we often see two sides of the same coin. God is sovereign. He saves. He secures your salvation. He enables you to persevere and conquer. But that does not mean you can be complacent. That does not mean you can be lazy spiritually. That doesn't mean you can lean back in your chair and say, you know, I can relax, you know, God's got it, and I can do whatever I want, even I can sin. No, that attitude is an evidence of a lack of genuine faith in God. You still must conquer. You still must persevere. And the true believers will see verses like this and be encouraged by this promise and be reminded to persevere. So don't take perseverance lightly. Never think to yourself, I professed faith, so I'm safe, so I'm in. There are real warnings in scripture which are meant to keep us vigilant. God secures us, but we still must not be foolhardy or presumptuous. We trust in God, but at the same time we press on. So we see two sides. God is sovereign and we are also responsible. We cannot really separate these two and focus on only one of them. God is sovereign. He will protect, but we are also responsible to press on. Now, the other promise here in verse 5, he says, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Jesus will personally declare that those saints who conquer are his. He will declare this in the presence of the father in heaven. Actually, in another place, Jesus said, those who deny me, I will deny them before my father. But here, if we confess, he will confess us before the Father. Now moving to the last verse is the same phrase we see in every letter to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you personally in this letter? And what's the Holy Spirit leading you to do in response to this letter? I would encourage you to spend some time to pray and to think about it we don't want to be a dying church. We don't want to be a dead Christian in name, right? It's even, an, uh, you can't really be a dead Christian, right? But within the visible church, there were people who thought they were Christians, but they were actually dead spiritually. We need spiritual life and we need it from Christ. So I would encourage you to come to the Lord. He is the one who sends the Holy Spirit. He's the one who fills you with the Holy Spirit. Come before him. Put him first. Whatever sins we've done, let us repent of them and let us get spiritual life from Christ. He is the vine and we are the branches. So we must be connected to him and we must receive nourishment from him. You could be the instrument of revival in your family and in your church, but you must preach the true gospel. You must preach it boldly without compromise because Jesus is the only solution to these problems we see around us. Jesus is the one who can bring us to the Father and give us salvation. I hope that this lesson on Revelation 3, 1 through 6, the letter to the church of Sardis, has been encouraging for you, and I hope that the Holy Spirit will lead you to make some response 
to this lesson and to this passage. I would invite you to subscribe to Study and Obey. You can receive the rest of the videos in our series on the book of Revelation as we continue to study and obey God's word one passage at a time. Thank you for joining and I hope you have a great day. God bless.